This is the Evergreen Empire. Green grow the forests and fair flow the streams. The gentle deer grazes, the wild blossom gleams. From ocean wave raging to mountain serene. All nature's proclaiming our land's evergreen. Welcome to Columbia Conversations. I'm Felix Bunnell, editor of Columbia Magazine for the Washington State Historical Society. On this episode, meet Faith Brower, curator at the Tacoma Art Museum, where a new exhibit called On Native Land is hoping to shift perspectives and enhance the context for appreciating the sometimes hidden cultural history in paintings of Western landscapes. My hope in the exhibition is to really focus on the on the communities whose lands are pictured and not on the, the artist's biography or the style in which the painting was made. Faith Brower is curator of Western American art at the Tacoma Art Museum. We spoke by phone in November 2021. Faith Brower, a curator of this new exhibit at the Tacoma Art Museum, thanks for joining us for this episode of Columbia Conversations. Thank you for having me, Felix. Now, the exhibit that is, it's already open now, the Tacoma Art Museum, it's open through, I think, well into 2023. It's called On Native Land, Landscapes from the, is it Haub Family Collection? Mm-hmm. And, That's right. And it's, it's they're images of they're la- American landscapes that depict areas where indigenous people have lived previously and may still live now. To tell me about how the exhibit came together. Sure. The um, exhibition stemmed from a project that we were working on at TAM, where we were developing land acknowledgments for the Puyallup tribe, whose homelands are where TAM's building um, is located in downtown Tacoma. And I was working on that project for TAM and helping to write the land acknowledgement to recognize and honor the Native American communities. Um, And when we were working on that project simultaneously, we were working on a, a separate exhibition where a curator from the, the Puyallup tribe, Charlotte Bash, had um, worked on an exhibition for Tam where she had juxtaposed an image of Mount Rainier um, and Coast Salish coastal waters with tribal youth today and a contemporary photograph of Puyallup tribal youth on the uh, coastal waters from which the painting had derived from. And it was this very meaningful uh, juxtaposition where she was really drawing attention to the fact that the landscape was empty. The painted landscape from Tam's collection was this beautiful picture of of the Puget Sound that many people would be familiar with, Um, but there was no human presence on the land. And she really wanted to offer a counter narrative for that painting by providing a contemporary photograph of tribal youth um, working and playing on on the coastlands. Um, And Charlotte's work on that project really just got me thinking differently about landscape paintings and how Uh, We have a number of landscape paintings in the Haup family collection that um, are often without any recognition for the Native American communities whose homelands are pictured. So because I think I was working on the project of land acknowledgments and then seeing Charlotte's great work, I thought that maybe we could merge these two ideas into the exhibition that we that we just opened on native land landscapes from the Haub family collection. Yeah, I know what you mean when you say and I I've, I've seen some of the images that are in the show I haven't haven't been there in person and I I've seen a lot of artwork landscape artwork over the years depicting the northwest or the west um and I guess it would be the 19th century. And you're right, they're all they're all sort of vacant. I mean with a, with a few rare exceptions, most of the are these sort of majestic, sublime scenes of, you know, familiar rivers and mountains and trees, but it's as if the indigenous population is sort of conveniently painted out or not painted there in the first place. And so it sounds like what this show is doing is a, like a contradiction or a counter-narrative to what's been this, um, I don't know, it hasn't even, there hasn't really been much of a debate, really, but art, this kind of fine art that we're talking about, has helped create this myth of this vacant landscape that Europeans then moved into, which we know that's we know that's completely false, but maybe we don't think about it enough. I think that's absolutely right. I think there's so much scholarship around how Western landscape paintings really promoted 
the movement of of settlers west into the US, they showed these spaces as huge wide open spaces that were kind of ripe for the taking, which couldn't of course been further from the truth. These were special places, sacred places, important resources for so many different Native American communities. So I'm hoping that through this exhibition, our visitors can learn about Native sovereignty and the the many hundreds of different Native American communities who live and and work and play across the land today. And if I understand it correctly, the exhibit isn't just um, fully baked and put up on display. There's an interactive component or a part where you're actually seeking additional information and context from people who either visit the exhibition or learn about it somehow. Yeah, my hope with this exhibition is to really invite people to share their own perspectives about the land um, and to offer Native communities an opportunity to share their insight into the places pictured. And so in the exhibition, we acknowledge and recognize 75 different Native American communities whose homelands are pictured in the paintings. And it's my hope to reach out to all of these communities to learn more about the places pictured. Um, and we've started those conversations with the Puyallup tribe who um, have been incredibly generous with their time and energy to help us think about this exhibition um, and their own great work around land acknowledgements. And so I, I hope that we can um, continue those conversations really across the country with many different communities to learn more about these special places. I think that's a great approach. And um, I've had a couple occasions in the last, I don't know, year or so to interview different staff people at the Puyallup Tribe and had just some really, met some really great people doing some really amazing work um, around exactly what you're talking about is, and also um, things around uh, restoring the original name of what, what we call Mount Rainier now. And I mean, it's part of this, it seems like the timing of, the, of this exhibit is good. Um, we're in this. We've arrived at this different moment in the last year or two around American culture and around race and class and you know what uh, institutional uh, projects like this and and how how traditional institutions engage indigenous groups, Native Americans, you know the different tribes. Is is there something? I mean, what can you say about the timing of this? How did the how did the timing happen to sort of coalesce for right now? Yeah, this project. Um... It stemmed out of a lot of the events that were happening in 2020 um, and just my my training in anti-racist thinking and strategies and how those could be incorporated into museum settings and uh, my work with the Puyallup tribe on the, the land acknowledgement and really giving more visibility for Native American communities in the museum setting. Um, and so I think this exhibition is certainly a product of the time. And um, and I hope that people can read into some of the subtleties and the nuances in the gallery to really appreciate the indigenous place names that we are centering um, rather than some of those more colonial narratives of our, the way we speak about these places like Mount Rainier. Um, and I know the the tribe is involved in great work in in promoting uh, Tula Shoot Seed um, names for the mountain, and and we hope to be able to share that information out further. Um, as you mentioned, this exhibition is on view for a number of years, so we we are really using this as a learning opportunity to find out more about the great work that Native American communities are doing around. Um, indigenous place names, land rights, water rights, um, environmental initiatives, and social justice work. And these paintings, they're all part of the Tacoma Art Museum's permanent collection? Um, that's right. We Well, we have one, uh, one print that is currently on loan to us from a private collector, but the other um, 13 works are from Tam's permanent collection. Now the ones that I that I saw, the ones that most captured my attention are the the local Northwest ones, like the Columbia River image. Um, what can you tell me about that particular painting? Yes, Nichiwana. Um, I imagine you you've had some speakers on this program before who have probably addressed the significance of the Columbia River on Indigenous communities on both sides of the river and and both sides of of the international border. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, well, that is the painting we have on view um, 
it's a it's a beautiful site along the the Nitiwana and um, my hope in the exhibition is to really focus on the on the communities whose lands are pictured and not on the the artist's biography ah. or the style in which the painting was made um but i have so wait, not so that was a um, bad question to ask then. <laughs> <laughs> well, just... I hope you don't mind if I skirt it a little bit. Well, I mean, we we we, we sort of do both. We we can say who the artist is and say what year it's from, right? We certainly can. Okay. The the painting is by John McStanley, and it's a historical Western landscape painting. Um, but my my real hope with um, showing that painting is that people can recognize that um, the Columbia River, uh, what we now call the Columbia River. It, is such an incredibly important resource to communities, I mean, throughout a vast region, right? And it brought communities together as a, a very important trading ground, both historically and it continues today with um, with the communities who live along the river and and those who have been relocated elsewhere, who return to the who return to the waters for that connection to their ancestors and to their life ways today. Yeah, I forget who it was I was talking to. This is probably five or ten years ago. Um, and this notion of how much the Columbia River has changed. I think it might have been Dave Nicandri, the former director of the Washington State Historical Society. But you, you look at the photographs of the Columbia, sort of the, the now and then photographs, or you read some of the, the accounts of the portages that were required to get around the different, the Dalles or the Cascades or whatever. And it all sort of, you know, it all, it all feels to me like bits of data. It doesn't really all kind of coalesce. And um, I think Dave McAndrew was telling me that back in the fifties, when, when one of the last dams was completed and Salilo Falls was inundated by water and that if someone, someone who'd been away for a while returned and the sound was different. The smell was different. Everything was just different about that river because this dam had just completely changed the, not the topography, but the water was now covering what had been the topography before. And so it was just completely transformed. And so I think a painting like this one, and then the work you're doing to to put it in context with the indigenous history and make it more, um, I guess, more respectful of the, the bigger picture history of, of that river, um, it's just, it's it's almost, it's very difficult to grasp. And I think this, an entry point like this, what you're describing and the, the way that you're um, forefronting the indigenous history rather than the artist or the, the timing, I think that's that's a useful way of getting at that bigger understanding of what the Columbia River, what it really was like when it was unfettered, when it was this, you know, series of obstacles and, you know, incredible source of fisheries and incredible source of, of folklore and knowledge and all these things. Instead of this very tame set of, oh, I don't know, captive stretches of river that are called lakes in many places, so I think I think this is I think you're onto something here with this with the with the, with the approach that you've taken. I think that's that's pretty cool. Um, now, is there another image that's from the Northwest that I recall when I was looking through the, the stuff you sent me? Certainly, yeah. I I mean it it definitely depends on how you define the Northwest, but we do have a painting of the um, Upper Missouri River at White Cliffs in Montana. Uh -huh. um, and then we have a painting of um, what we know as Galliano Island in British Columbia, Canada, which is kind of just over the international bo uh, border mm -hmm. near Vancouver Island. Mm -hmm. um, and if you go so far as to consider Alaska as part of the Northwest, then we do have a picture of um, a beautiful painting of, of Denali. Yeah, that Galliano image is good. I, I was at Galliano Island. Oh, God, it's been 20 years, I think. Um, but, you know, in terms of the border, I mean, if you didn't know it, or you didn't have GPS, or you weren't looking at a map, you really wouldn't know that the border was there. It's all very, you know, it's all one one ecosystem, one region, um, which I think a show like this also helps underline when you have images that are uh, from what's now Canada and also from what's now Washington. It really sort of makes those borders not arbitrary, but it makes it really clear how it, it is pretty arbitrary in terms of a political thing rather than rather than anything else. Um, now the uh, what when when you first come into the museum, describe how the show is set up. Describe what what it's um, what the setup is like for the the way things are displayed. Oh sure, yeah. The exhibition opens um, with a section that really highlights um, Tam's place on the ancestral homelands of the Puyallup tribe of Indians, and and so when you enter the space, you'll hopefully be greeted by a, a video land acknowledgement that the Puyallup tribe 
tribe produced and put out about a year ago. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been circulating in social media and in various sites. And with their permission, we are playing that video land acknowledgement in the gallery. And I think it's such a powerful way to instantly be recognizing and hearing and having these kind of sensory experiences with um, the idea of place and homelands and how that connects to indigenous languages. A lot of the, the video land acknowledgement that the tribe uh, produced is spoken in Twilishootseed as well as English. They visit different important sites um, around Tacoma and on the Puyallup Tribe Reservation that are familiar to many people who live in the area. And so it's a nice way to kind of instantly connect with Tam's place and the art museum's place in Tacoma and how that is really connected to the Puyallup Tribe who um, of course have one of the most urban reservations in the country mm -hmm. um, located in between Tacoma and Puyallup. And then, I mean, it's, it sounds like this is a, it's not just a, you know, people walking around a gallery looking at pretty pictures. I mean, this is sort of the, this is this, there's this, there's a bigger idea behind this exhibit, which you've described pretty well. Um, is that, I mean, does art have this special ability to, uh, to address this kind of, this sort of turning point there right now, or this pivot point, or however you want to characterize it in terms of how we understand, you know, indigenous relations, just basic social relations in the, in the, U.S. or Western society here in 2021? Is, a, is there a special role that art can play as we go forward? Yeah, I think art has such an important foundational role for people today and just in being able to see how artists are interpreting the world around us and how they can share various perspectives and ideas that can lead us all to thinking um, differently about or just more deeply about our lives and where we are at um, in the world today. And I think for a collection like ours at TAM that includes both historical work and contemporary work, it, it really creates this opportunity to think about the past and, and how that's influenced where we are now. And um, that's one of the, the goals I have for this show is to really be able to show how these paintings transcend time and that they have these really deep and meaningful connections to people today um, across Native America. Yeah, I like I really like the approach to sort of this transparent kind of work in progress approach where the, the, the information will build and grow over the time the display is up. It's, it's very cool. It's a, it's a really neat way to do it, not have it just kind of be done behind the scenes and then have these different partnerships and conversations just sort of happening off to the side. I like that it's this sort of forefronted, forefronted part. That's pretty cool. So, all right, Faith Brower, you're the Hob Curator of Western American Art at Tacoma Art Museum. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Columbia Conversations, and let's hope people can get down to the Tacoma Art Museum to get a look at On Native Land. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you to Faith Brower of Tacoma Art Museum for speaking with me for this episode of Columbia Conversations from the Washington State Historical Society. For more information about Tacoma Art Museum and the exhibit On Native Land, visit tacomaartmuseum.org. For more information about Columbia Magazine or to subscribe, please visit washingtonhistory.org. I'm Felix Bunnell.